Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Yoram. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks. Um, thanks for uh, for joining. So we're still waiting for uh, for Sol. He's uh, he's going to be here any minute. Um, but I will just uh, give uh, a welcome to everybody. So welcome to today's event. Thanks a lot for joining. We have a very exciting show today. Um, it's about how to select the right investors to support your startup along the long journey. Uh, and of course, we will take also a closer look at today's market environment. It's a very relevant topic now. Uh, today's event is the first in a content series during uh, May and June. Two days from now, we're going to release our annual deal room investor ranking, uh, which is the most comprehensive data-driven, transparent, and founder-friendly ranking of the world's best venture capital investors. And I cannot comment yet on the results, uh, but you have to wait two more days. So two seed stage for VC firms that have always been highly ranked in past editions are Local Globe and Point9. And therefore, I'm very excited to talk with today's guests. Uh, and, uh, and and thankful that they could make the time in their in their busy schedule. Um, I know that Christophe is now at an offsite in uh, Portugal, so he made the time to, to be available here. Um, and uh, and Sol Klein will also join. So, quick intro uh, about point nine. I think not everybody uh, uh, has the full background, although many people do. So Point9 has a global portfolio of iconic startups it, uh, invested from the seed stage. I saw, um, we're just uh, going through the intro. Um, and uh, many of the iconic startups that have been backed by Point9 include companies like Revolut, Delivery Hero, Algolia, Contentful, Chainalysis, and I could go on. Christoph Jans is also well known for writing highly practical blog posts about scaling and hiring that are very much loved by the founder community. I just saw he posted another one, uh, I think a few hours ago. And before being a VC, Christoph was also an entrepreneur uh, with uh, two, at least two exits under his belt. The other guest today is Sol. Thank you for joining. Um, so is the co-founder of Local Globe, and yeah, many of you know uh, uh, both Sol and Local Globe. But for those of you who don't, so Local Globe is a leading seed stage investor uh, that has also launched uh, a separate fund called Latitude, which invests in the later stage companies. Uh, they're also behind the Newton Venture Program, which creates a new generation of investment professionals from diverse walks of life. Uh, Sol was also co-founder of SeedCamp, which is another top-ranked seed investor. And before that, uh, was at Index Ventures and also an entrepreneur who co-founded Love Film, which Amazon acquired in 2011. So I could go on, um, but yeah, let's just get uh, started and let's get into the, the conversation. Uh, and I would like to split today's conversation in three parts. So starting with, I think, the question on everybody's mind is the current market sentiment uh, and how that affects startups. Um, then I would like to go into kind of your approach to finding the best startups to invest in. And finally, your approach to helping startups post investment. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay. Um, yeah, so starting with the current kind of market sentiment, slash downturn. Uh, so last year it felt as if we were kind of swimming in a sea of capital. I think I saw also some of your posts, you were on the one hand worried, on the other hand excited about what it can do for the ecosystem. Uh, now on Twitter, there's a lot of kind of yeah, drama, scaremongering, especially in the US, um, but now also in Europe. So I'm yeah, curious to hear what's your perspective, what's going on and what, what are you seeing? Whoever wants to start. Go on, Christoph. All right. Hi, hi Saul. Hey. Uh, thanks for the intro, Joram, and hi to everybody also who is listening uh, or viewing in here. Um, yeah, happy to start. And, and obviously, Saul, please feel free to chime in at any time. So um, I, I think as human 
beings, we tend to exaggerate um, everything in, in both directions, right? Like um, making the maybe the highest to high and, and the lowest to lowest ten, things tend to be um, extreme. And there are like, like cycles that kind of feed itself. So I um, think when, um, when people like say like, um, everything knows only one direction, like every company will be a unicorn. Like, obviously this is, this is like, uh, exaggerating the, the justified amount of optimism, but then at the same time, if, um, overnight, um, people say, and I'm not even sure if people say this, I haven't checked my Twitter feed in the last couple of days that much. Like if say like startups are dead and tech is dead, obviously this is also an, an exit an exaggeration. Um, and I, I think uh, at least when it comes to the, the public markets, I think Warren Buffett said something like the Mr. Market um, acts like a drunken psycho. Like um, on, on one day he is extremely over optimistic or enthusiastic. And then another day he's extremely depressed. And, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And, and I think that's true. Um, and we, we've only just... Uh, started like this this potential downturn um, we can debate if the if that's already been the worst or if it will get a lot worse before it gets better but yeah i, I let Saul maybe um maybe share his thoughts on that before i continue um thanks christoph and thanks yoram and uh hi everyone and apologies for being a bit late um yeah, I mean, I guess my perspective on this is, you know, I'm pretty old now. I'm going to be 52 this year. And I started being active in this, broadly speaking, this internet industry um, nearly 28, 30 years ago. And I remember the first sort of um, crisis that happened, I think it was in around 97, it was the Asian financial crisis when Oracle missed their quarter and Netscape missed their quarter. And, you know, there wasn't Twitter then, but the general feeling at the time was there would never be another internet company that would go public. We know what happened between 98 and 2001. There were a lot of internet companies that went public, including a whole load no one will know or has ever heard of again, like the globe. You know, this this was the era where Yahoo bought GeoCities for four billion, bought Broadcast.com. I mean, this is kind of ancient history. Then we went through 9/11 and the bubble bursting. Then we went through, um, you know, the financial crisis and Lehman in 2007-8. More recently, you know. Just over two years ago, at the end of February, March 2002, the front page of the Financial Times was that this was the worst economic downturn in 300 years. 300 years. And then we all know what happened the 18 months after that. So I'm not saying, you know, I think it's a similar point to Christoph that we're overreacting. What I am saying is that, you know, these cycles, they're cycles, they're called cycles for a reason, you know, um, and there is no question that in 2021, just like in 2007, and just like in 2001, we were at the peak of a cycle, quite frankly, 2001 in the 25 plus years that I've been in this sector was the highest ever and was clearly unsustainable. Just from a well-being perspective, it was unsustainable to investors, to founders, to everyone. So there's no question things were gonna come back down to earth. I think the question for founders and the question for investors is like, what do you do you know, when markets correct? And you know, the advice that we would always give, and we were giving this to our portfolio in, 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 in early February, because, you know, you could see it coming, and this was before the next crisis, which was the Ukraine, is that control the things that you can control. And one of the only things you can control is cash. 
I mean, I know this is an unpopular topic, but actually, you know, in a sense, startups are an exercise in, in managing dependencies and minimizing dependencies because there are all sorts of things we all know that can go wrong that you can't control. You can actually control your cash. So kind of control what you can control and focus on, you know, on, on, on being there for the long term and building for the long term. Um, and I think, you know, that is a mindset that the best founders and the best investors have regardless of conditions. Conditions can get better, they can get worse, but the best founders, the best investors have very level heads and can they control what they can control. Um, the other thing I just would briefly say that I think is really important in all weather is alignment. So, you know, arguably the alignment between founders and investors got very, very stretched in the last two, three, four years. And I actually think, you know, the best results come when there is genuine alignment between founders, teams, and their investors, because then everyone is in it for the same and hopefully the biggest possible outcome. So I think, you know, my view is we're actually, I know our job is to be paid optimists and we kind of like have the glass half full, not the glass half empty. My view is like the next 18 to 24 months are gonna be an amazing time to be a founder, great time to be an investor because we're back to like focusing on the fundamentals, focusing on, on alignments, and also, you know, we're doing it in an age when no one questions anymore how fundamental science and technology are to growth and innovation. I mean, when the bubble burst in 2001, everyone was dancing on the grave of the internet saying, those fucking stupid kids, those dot-com people, they're such idiots, you know, we'll, we'll, we've seen the back of them. You know, it's like, no. None of us survived COVID, even our grandparents, without the underlying infrastructure of the internet. So I think, you know, it's not RIP good times. It's like, let's get back to business. Right. And so and you talked about alignment and that this was getting stretched previously. Can you, yeah, either of you kind of expand on that? What, what do you mean by that? I mean, I'm happy to mention it quickly, but I know Christoph will really, you know, having sat on all sides of the table, will have lots of great insights here. But alignment to me is that, you know, you're all in it together. It's not just about the founder. It's not just about the investors. But, you know, one is reaching an equilibrium where, you know, where things feel fair. I mean, I can't explain it any better than that. It's like, you know, there are times in the cycle where investors feel, oh, it's so unfair, you know, the founders have all the rights, you know, the pricing is insane. There are times in the cycle where founders feel like, you know, the investors have all of the leverage, this is totally unfair. It's like finding those points of fairness and alignment and making and understanding like the best results come from actually everyone around the table feeling aligned rather than, you know, it feeling like it's a sort of a, an imbalance. And I think a lot of a lot of misalignment in the last, especially two years, has come from the fact that round sizes, in many cases, were not determined by um, what founders actually wanted to raise based on their budget and their planning and their ability to to hire great people and, and onboard them, but really by a desire by investors and obviously mostly bigger later stage funds to just deploy. Money obviously they can't do it without um, founders agreeing to it, um, but still, like the pressure um, got so big that I would argue almost, I don't know, probably ninety percent of the round sizes in the last two years, like meaning before this, um, before the, the downturn or before the the crisis in Ukraine that maybe triggered triggered that. I think most of the round sizes um, were um, like sort of inflated or companies ended up raising more than they were planning to raise because um, there's just well, there was just so much 
desire from large funds to deploy more capital. And if founders are then extremely disciplined and use that capital to increase their runway from two years to four years, or use that money to just grow at a really high efficiency, then it's it's all great, right? But the, the, diff, the, the problem is that so many times it leads to doing the wrong things, like just scaling prematurely, hiring 10 salespeople before the first two ones are um, effective and all these classical mistakes. It's just really, really hard to have 30 million in the bank as a seed stage, series A stage start, startup and, and not touch it. Um, and I think it's, this is um, maybe ex, like, um, like amplified by the fact that investors have a portfolio, right? So they can pretty much take any risk with any company because the logic is some of them will be so successful that they offset all the others. Um, and founders, on the other hand, they, in most cases, have only one company, at least one at, one at any time. And um, that I think that can contribute to, to the misalignment too. I mean, I think this is an excellent point that Christoph's making is this point about, you know, conviction. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, there are two things we encourage founders to think about when they're raising their seed round. You know, one is, and I know Yoram, you've done some great data on this, and Christoph, you've, you've tweeted some of this data in the past, is that, you know, what is the conversion rate? Um, so, you know, if you're taking money from seed fund A, B, or C, what is their conversion rate to helping the companies that they work with get to a, a series A? And I think at least in your last data set, the average was 17% of companies that raise a seed round never go on to raise a series A, which would suggest that failure is a feature, it's not a bug. Now, there are certain funds that if you raise capital from them, your chances of getting to a series A are two or three times greater. So I would always encourage founders to ask the fund, what is your conversion rate from seed to A? The other question that I don't think gets asked enough, mainly because founders aren't necessarily, you know, taught to understand the business model of a venture fund. You know, as Christoph says, you know, the business model of a venture fund is to manage a portfolio. And the question we encourage founders to ask is like uh, an investor, like what is your conviction ratio? And the conviction ratio is like, if you've got a fund that is 300 million and you're writing, offering a check for 3 million, your conviction ratio is 1%. If you've got a fund that is 100 million and you write a check for 3 million, your conviction ratio is 3%. And you can decide whether you want to take money from a fund that has 300 to invest in seed stage or a fund that has 100 to invest in seed stage. But it's pretty obvious that the conviction ratio of the smaller fund is 3x the conviction ratio of the bigger fund. So I think, you know, one has to be aware of, as you said, Christoph, you know, how invested, and this goes back to alignment, is my new partner, aka my investor, in the success long term of my business how much conviction do they have given that i have a hundred percent conviction or if i'm like elon musk 20 percent conviction because i got five companies that would make sense so you said that last year and in the previous years there was a lot of misalignment going on i guess i also read about kind of the deal velocity was like crazy high that People were very fast with providing term sheets to certain startups. Um, and, and now you do you feel like now kind of they're, they're, it's kind of going back to normal? So you, maybe you feel more comfortable with that? You, you were quoting Warren Buffett. I think he also said to be greedy when others are fearful, and fearful when others are greedy. Like, how do you look at that? Yeah, um, I, I think we are always long-term greedy 
Um, so like in, 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 the, in the short term, I think we try not to react to, to what's in, in the market. I, I do think that if things cool down a little, that will maybe make our job easier or, or, or better. So I, I don't think there will be um, less great startups, uh, less opportunities. Lots of great startups have, have been founded in previous downturns. And, and if we have um, a bit more time to do our work and to, uh, to make decisions, um, we would definitely welcome that for sure. Um, again, in this in these slightly crazy two years, um, 2020 and, and 2021, um, a lot of uh, financing rounds were done in like in days, um, and we we made a couple of investments uh, during these extremely compressed um, processes. But I don't think it's the best way of doing it because it's a cliche, but um, uh, partnering a partnership between founders and investors is is really like a like a marriage, you might spend a similar amount of time together and it's probably even harder to divorce. Um, so I think it's really very advisable for both sides to just take the time and get to know each other, even if it takes an, another week um, and reference investors um, uh, ruthlessly. Um, I think it, that's always time well spent. I think in the last two years, there was a dynamic that because things were so competitive, like the investors who were the fastest try, try to apply pressure on founders to, to close uh, or sign a term sheet. And, and that's hard to resist if maybe, if, especially if this is maybe the first time that you're going through this fundraising circus. Um, um, so um, we um, obviously fundraising is, is also a distraction from the real business for a founder. So I'm not suggesting it took, it should take three months to raise a seed round or, or a series A. Um, but I think it's better if it takes a couple of weeks than if you expect to do it within two days. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. Although I have to say, as someone who decided to get married after four days and will celebrate my 20th anniversary this year, you know, I also believe in trusting your instincts and uh, and 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 following conviction. And I actually think there were a lot of bad habits developed in the last eighteen to twenty-four months on both sides of the table. But I actually think fundamentally, seed stage and early stage investing is about conviction. And you know, a lot of the work that people do is to sort of test their guts you know, like referencing and sort of, you know, understanding uh, team and product. But I, if, if I'm being honest, and I think if a lot of investors are being honest, you kind of make your mind up pretty quickly. And then, you know, backing your conviction is something you can do pretty quickly. Now, I still think where one should take the time is to make sure that there is real genuine alignments about what are the long-term ambitions and visions about the business, how much capital the business really needs, what are the things that the company needs to be focused on for the first 18 to 24 months, how do you get to a great Series A. Those are the things I think one needs to spend time discussing. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, I've... I fall in love pretty quickly and I've stayed in love for like 20 years. So um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think we can sort of persuade ourselves that length of time equals sort of um, strength of commitments. And I'm not sure it's always, it's not always that way. Um, I, I, I agree. And it, it's, it, I didn't know that you decided to, uh, to marry after after four days. Uh, it's a longer that's a, story. I'll tell you something. It's, okay. but it's yeah. impressive. And I we definitely have these cases too where after the first meeting, we know we just want to really want to invest in, in this company. And then you do a little bit of 
due diligence and you just hope that you don't find any red flags, but the decision has kind of been made by your gut already. Um, but I would say there are some exceptions to this when it's an industry where you that you didn't know nothing about yeah. in, I don't know, container shipping or yeah. metals trading. You just need to talk to people or, or yeah. read some things. And um, then I think then there is maybe where the um, conviction ratio comes in, which is a great metric that I haven't heard about like as a, as a number, Please, but it's actually... Please add it to your napkin. No, it's, it's, it's actually great. I think it's, as a founder, you should have, you should shoot for a certain or a conviction ratio right and probably it's, it should probably be i don't know two or three percent or, but not a fraction of a percent and here um i think it's easier to get to the conviction if your conviction actually means it's a tenth of a percent um yeah. like if you're a billion dollar fun yeah it's pretty you don't just don't need that much commit uh, conviction for but it but i think your, dollar point, check, yeah. your point christoph about i know you know axel mm -hmm. used the phrase which you know louis pasteur created mm -hmm. like chance favors the prepared mind yeah you know i think if you have a prepared mind on a space yeah. it's a lot easier you know in in hours to really say okay you know these guys, this is it, you know, like you already know what's the space you're looking for. You already know the way you think it should be approached and they're doing it. Yeah. And I think in those cases you can act really fast and to be fair to tiger. And I think they get a bad rap. They are coming with a prepared mind. You know, they are not coming saying like, we don't understand this space. They're coming like saying, we understand this space. We've seen it from the public markets down yeah. and so you know they are making very very rational decisions not you know just spreading money so i think you know a combination of a prepared mind and and high conviction is very very powerful and you know that is a new factor in in the market and you know we're lucky we now got 12 people on our investment team which means that on a a vast variety of topics we've always got two or three people who have a prepared mind on a certain area it doesn't mean there aren't new areas as you say that that you know one comes across and, and discovers and then you've got to play catch up but i think the more you have a prepared mind mindset on some of the investors i admire the most like axel and bessemer i mean this is how these guys think very thematically you know, they build long-term roadmaps. They know what they're looking for. And when they find it, you know, they don't need validation from anyone else. They act. Yeah, so we, we've went really into, the, into your approach to investing, which is exactly the, the kind of next topic. Uh, and just for the audience to know, like, um, your funds together have invested in, according to our latest count, 25 unicorns even more future unicorns in the pipeline. So there's like this massive um, uh, like power law also where actually some investors do way better than others. And I think that both of you don't really like to kind of toot your own horn, but um, what we were just talking about, like conviction and this kind of love at first sight, what, what kind of factors do you think have been important in, um, in, 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 yeah, finding the right investments. Um, it's, it's a, I, I'm sure it's a combination of many things, including luck, being at the right moment, being at the right place at the right time. So, for example, my my first, actually, my my first in, investment, which was an angel investment before point nine, was in was in Zendesk, um, which obviously it was incredible luck, right? And even you could even argue that it was a certain amount of naivete that led me to invest in this company and that let people who knew much more about enterprise software um, pass on it. So um, I, I think um, we, I think it's easy to think, and especially in the market from the last two years, that you invest in a company and it gets marked, it gets marked up three months later and you're a genius. So um uh, definitely uh, i think uh, uh, like 
that, that's definitely something to be uh, mindful of that it even even though I've been on the investing side now for more than 12 years, um, we now see the success of companies that we invested in in the first half of that. Um, most of the more recent investments are still uh, quite early in this, so they show promising signs, but um, it's it's not like we can declare victory here like we we've done it and every your prop I mean, there's a saying which is also true is you're only as good as your most recent um in investment so you you can't rest but maybe to answer still try to answer your question maybe of like what do we look for um or, or what is it also that we love when an associate joins us and and who um like what are the qualities in an investor i think it's it's really independent independent thinking is i think one of the most important um qualities if you just chase what others are chasing maybe that leads to okay results but to uh, generate like really exceptional returns you occasionally have to be right like you have to make a lot of bets or investments that might look pretty crazy at the time you do them and then some of them that will will fail, um, and but but some of them will turn out to be massive successes. But I think you only get this when you when you take different types of types of risks, whether that's um, investing in a, a founder that is unproven or in a geography that others might think is too too much like too much too far away or is somehow um, uh, like not not within their reach. Or just invest earlier than others, or or just 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 find a way to to differentiate as well. And what do you do? Is a question for both. Like when you disagree with with your partners, for example, you have a strong conviction. Your partner doesn't. Uh, I guess that hap must happen, especially the way you just uh, described it. Yeah. I can quickly answer and then I let Saul give give his perspective too. So we we discuss every single deal in our in our investment team, but we don't aim to. Um, oh, I'm getting some echo now. I don't know if that's from. I quickly go on mute and unmute myself. Let's see if that works better. Yeah. Um, so we thanks. Like so we. We discuss everything. Uh, we, we we give each other honest feedback, um, but in the end, uh, it's it's enough if one of us really loves a company. If like if Pavel wants to do an investment, and I'm and nobody else in the partnership or in the team gets it, then what it means that is he'll he'll do some some more extra work, and we come back to us a couple of hours later or the next day and see if there is some new way to explain it or more data or uh, a suggestion to maybe need the founders again or like to basically bring some more uh, uh, materials which might um, convince the, the rest of the team. But, but in the end, um, it's, uh, it's enough if one of us is, is really optimistic. I, I would say the, the less convinced the, the partnership or the bigger team is, the more convinced the one who is leading should be. So it kind of raises the bar. Um, but uh, I think most of the time, we it's not like we all agree, but like, like maybe one of us has spent most time with the founders and is therefore really, really excited. And then maybe the rest of the team uh, is excited, but doesn't have as much conviction because maybe they haven't spent as much time with it. Um, so we, we never really were in a place where one of us wanted to do it. Um, somebody threatened to veto it and we would look, have to look up in our contracts. Well, what did, what did we actually agree how to resolve such a conflict? It never happened. Yeah. I mean, I, I really agree with that approach and I think it's very, very hard in whatever the market conditions, but particularly hard in the last 18 to 24 months for teams, investment teams that don't operate with a kind of a conviction mindset to, to get things done, but most importantly to sort of build empathy uh, with a founder. 
I think, you know, founders can tell, you know, uh, if an investor is, you know, doesn't have the backing of their of their partnership. And I mean, in the worst cases, you know, an investor will say, you know, I'm trying to persuade my partnership to do this, that and the other. And, you know, as a founder, I would run a million miles if I heard that, because, you know, you want to know that you're getting into business with with a with a firm, not just with an individual. And unless firms invest individuals with the ability to sort of to, to, to have conviction and then to, you know, follow that conviction is very, very hard to sort of sign that kind of emotional contract between the investor and the founder. And I think, you know, like Christoph said, it doesn't mean that people within an investment team shouldn't get others on the investment team to share their conviction. We talk about shared conviction, but I don't need to agree with someone else's conviction to share that conviction. I just have to empathize and say, like Christoph said, you know, George, Suzanne, Julia, they've spent more time thinking about this. They spend more time with the founder. Fine. Great. Let's do it. You know, you know, let's support, that person. And I think, you know, in my experience, again, going back to firms like Bessemer, who I think just do this incredibly well, and Andreessen, I think also do this incredibly well, is, you know, you you can't operate a partnership where people are kind of like voting and it's consensus. You have to back people's conviction because that's the glue, that's trust, you know, that's what keeps a partnership together. So, you know, I, I I strongly agree with Christoph on this point. Okay. And if we can just zoom in a little bit on this topic, it was actually, uh, I think, I, you know, I asked, I, try, I was trying to get to what is kind of the success factor for a VC. And I know that, uh, Christoph, you said, well, uh, we were lucky and we're only as good as our last investment. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a modest answer, but uh there must be kind of I mean, more well let me i i agree with christoph there's lots of different factors and luck is definitely one of them i mean the thing that we look for and try and develop as investors and within our team is empathy you know i think that that for me is a sort of the key ingredients to being a successful investor is, is empathy. Now, sometimes you have that empathy because you've been a founder or you've been an operator. Sometimes you develop that empathy over time because you've been a student of, of founders. And, um, you know, I mean, like my old partner, Danny Reimer, you know, he wasn't an, an operator. He wasn't an entrepreneur, but he was an analyst at investment bank. He'd studied and spent time with so many fantastic founders and, and CEOs that you start to develop a sense of like an empathy of like what this looks like. So I, I actually think empathy is really key. I think, you know, going into a conversation with a founder and not having anything to say in terms of that's empathetic, not like, can you tell me your CAC to LTV ratio or like how big is your TAM? I mean, that's not empathy. That's like a question that, you know, Google would ask. Um, so, you know, the ability to to have empathy, to develop empathy is very, very fundamental. And then I'd say the other thing which Christoph is saying in a nice way is humility. Like if you are a student, as both of us are, of the greatest data set that in fact, you know, exists in venture, which is the Horsley Bridge data set going back to 1985, what that data set tells you, and, you know, if anyone wants to see some of it, Chris Dixon wrote a great blog post about I think it was called Babe Ruth Economics. 62% of capital you invest, you get 1x or below, i.e. you are wrong 62% of the time. That's quite humbling. And then you look at, say, Jeremy Levine and Sarah Tavell's Series A memo on Pinterest, and you look at the outcome analysis that they do at the end of their memos. And the best case scenario, the 3% best case scenario on Pinterest was 
It defined visual commerce. It had 30 million MAUs and it exited for 800 million. So basically, you're wrong 62% of the time. And then when you're right, you're wrong by an order of magnitude. So like that takes a lot of humility to be wrong most of the time. It's just, you know, you hope you're wrong on the upside more than you're wrong on the downside. Okay. And I think that's a great takeaway for founders in uh, terms of what to look for. Yeah. And anything you want to add to that, Christoph? Yeah. yeah. And in what, what has worked well for us but um, this is really just what really our perspective and other funds have been successful with very different approaches um, but just judging from uh, like our history like it, it has served us well that we've always been um, highly focused like we've been um, focused on SaaS or B2B SaaS and B2B marketplaces for the last 12 years or so like probably 95% of our investments fall into these uh, two, two categories um, and always at the seed stage. So we've, um, we've invested in about a hundred companies in like within that definition and have seen thousands or, or tens of thousands. And um, I think that allows us to just be better at what we're doing here. And, and we, there are many things that we don't do like later stage investments or investing in all kinds of areas that are super exciting, but it's just not, we just don't have the expertise there. So we decided to go um, really deep into, um, into a certain area. And I think that has helped us both be better at um, evaluating companies um, in, that, in that area and then also helping them um, supporting them and getting them and helping them get to the next stage. Yeah, that makes sense. So talking about support, <clears throat> which was our kind of our third and final uh, segment, um, I see that we only have 11 minutes left. Um, I saw also some good questions from the audience, which I want to get into, but um, just talking about kind of your approach to helping startups post investment. Um, so, we, we did uh, some research on this as well, as you know, and found huge differences in the graduation rate from seed to series A uh, per investor. And so, yeah, like Sol said, the average was about 17%. Uh, in some countries, a bit higher, others a bit lower. Uh, but there is a massive difference also between investors. So the, the top tier investors have a graduation rate closer to 40% where the bottom tier investors is more uh, below 10%. So in other words, there's a kind of four times higher chance to graduate to Series A, uh, depending on the, 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 the investor that's backing you. Um, and, and then as we saw also earlier, a lot of those investors that gra do graduate to Series A have a much higher chance to becoming a, a unicorn. So um, my question, I guess, is, how important do you think is it is the selection in determining that outcome and how, how important is the, the help that you, where you can make a difference? Um, I mean, I, yeah, so please sure. go ahead. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, this is kind of nature versus nurture debate, yeah. right? I mean, obviously picking is, is really important, um, but again, this is part of the network effect of venture. If you are you know, picking from a great pool, you know, your likelihood of being able to pick, you know, winners is probably better than if you're picking from a less good pool. And I think this historically was the argument that people in Silicon Valley would make about like why you could only, why you only needed to be in Silicon Valley and fish from that pool because the pool was so great. But I think when we, when we ask founders what are the things that are most important in terms of support, I mean, I don't know if, if you've done this analysis, but it would be quite interesting to do. Is like when we first came into the seed market, the biggest realization we made is that people didn't have enough capital at seed stage to get to a good Series A. You know, we would argue that if you're a software company, you need 18 to 24 months of revenue-free runway to get to a good series A. If you are a science company, deep tech, hard tech, you probably need three years of revenue free runway to get from a seed to a great series A. So, I mean, I know it sounds like ridiculously simple. It's going back to cash. 
if you don't give companies enough capital, it is much harder for them to get to the next stage. And then I think a lot of what we focus on, and I know people like First Round do the same thing, is really, really helping seed stage founders understand who are the best investors to get a, a great Series A from, what are the kind of things they're looking for, laser-focused introductions, not just saying, hey, I met this person at a conference, you should go meet them, the right partner, the right fund, the right amount of time before you need the capital, and just helping people sort of think about how, how they manage their capital is absolutely fundamental. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we, we do, you know, workshops, communities, well-being support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you, I think if you ask people what really makes the difference in terms of graduation rates and then also how much follow-on capital people raise and from whom, I mean, our portfolio raised 9.4 billion of follow-on last year. Um, you know, a lot of this goes down to making sure people have enough capital and that they are managing that capital in a way that gets them to the right, the right next level. And by the way, that's regardless of stage, not just C to A. Yeah, and, and, and just to add, um, it, yeah, it's, it's indeed like nature versus nurture. And in most cases where you ask these questions, I think the answer is both. I think it's not different here. So yes, I think it depends on the ability to uh, to find great companies in, in the first place, but then it's also about helping them become more successful than they otherwise would have. Um, and part of it is helping companies actually become better companies, um, right? Like fundamentally better companies that, as Saul mentioned, manage their cash better, go into the right segments, uh, increase the bar when it comes to hiring, um, all, all kinds of operational and strategic um, matters. Um, but it's also then about the fundraising process itself. So um, you, you could argue that even if we didn't make the companies better, which I think we do, but even if we didn't, we might be able to get them into a better Series A, just yeah. because there is... If you said that Saul and I are really bad at everything, then I think you would still have to admit we're very good at financing because that's basically what we've done countless times, maybe hundreds of times. So this is really like as a, as a seed investor, you're really dependent on Series A financing down the road because we're not funding companies all the way to, to yeah. IPO. So we just know who the best Series A investors are, for which company, for which stage like when is it the right the right time to get out and and then also make sure that the the founders get the full attention of the of the partners at the right companies because we've built these relationships over the last 20 or sometimes 30 years yeah one one thing i would just add which i think one of the the companies we we share and we both invested in at seed stage, you know, inspired us to do, and we now do this with all companies when we first invest is, you know, we encourage companies right at the beginning of our journey with them to write their Wikipedia page 10 years from now. And this was inspired by Ron and Christoph when, mm -hmm. from Brecky, when he came to, to pitch us and he'd written his Wikipedia page and we're like, whoa, you know, like, that's so cool. Like this guy is sort of projecting himself out into the future and he's really helping us sort of understand where he wants to get to. So, you know, while managing the capital, getting to the next level when it comes to financing is absolutely sort of fundamental and something any seed funds and quite frankly, I think any investor needs to do really well we find this Wikipedia exercise really helpful because, you know, one of the things that's really hard to do when you're in the day to day of managing your business is like, you know, pick yourself up and say, okay, well, like, why am I actually doing this? You know, what am I, where am I trying to get to 10 years from now? And that document, you know, the 10 years from now document is incredibly valuable, not just in terms of where you're going, but thinking through all of the challenges and the controversies you will face along the way. 
And it allows us to actually have some pretty tough discussions right at the beginning with people to sort of project out 10 years from now and say, hey, you know, when you go public, you know, what are your diversity metrics going to look like? Um, you know, and if you don't like make a difference to them in your first 20 hires, by the time you're at 200 people, it's too late. You know, if you don't look at carbon removal today, you know, you're not going to want to look at it when you've got 3000 people and you're six weeks before going on the road to an IPO. If you are, you know, building a brain computer interface, you know, not will it work, but who won't you sell it to? So I think, you know, tools like this also allow you to have hard strategic discussions with, with, with founders that, you know, not all investors will have. And I think, you know, that's really important as well as the, the kind of the blocking and the tackling of who you're going to raise your next round from, which is the fundamental piece. Um, great. I, I see we have only a couple of minutes left and we got some questions from, um, from founders in the audience. So totally kind of different topic, but I think it's, they're interesting questions. So you were talking about cash management so at the beginning. Uh, someone is asking, what do you think about venture debt? Uh, and I think, I, 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 think, I think on the right terms, it's fantastic. You know, any, I think there is nowhere near enough knowledge in the venture community, not just on the founder side, but on the investor side in terms of debt as well as equity. Obviously, investors push equity because that's in their interests. But there are many, many times when, you know, working capital, venture debt, acquisition financing, lending is, is absolutely the right thing to do. And a smart investor should know all of the right providers and be able to help you work through that and you know nowadays it's not just the venture debt providers we just backed a company in stockholm arc capital that's doing this precision uh financing based on you know a lot of data in your erp obviously you know there are people like pipe and others that are doing this so this whole area i think is exploding for for, for startups and it's great because you know no business got really big on equity alone Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we, we've seen this in the last years, um, maybe five years or more, that there are like more, many more options have become available, right? I think like 10 years ago, probably um, banks would only give you money when you don't need it anymore, right? Um, but um, Silicon Valley Bank and, and um, several other American, but also European players have, have like made venture debt available at significantly earlier stages. Um, I guess it's because the whole market has just understood, um, especially the value of high margin subscription revenue, um, much better than it used to be the case. And companies that have a couple of million in ERR and some understanding of churn and retention, they, many of them, maybe most of them in, in our portfolio have um, added some amount of venture debt to uh, to uh, to their to their raises um, in the last couple of years. Okay, so not not a, not a hard no, and actually can be useful. No. Sure. Yeah. Great. Uh, if you have one two more minutes, um, a totally I different did. question. Okay, totally different question, but I thought it's an interesting one. How do you look at startups that outsource their tech? Very tough. I, I think, you know, so talking as a founder that outsourced our first tech build when we were building out uh, Video Island Love Film to get to market quickly, you know, you're just storing up uh, debt. You know, if you're going to be, I mean, Goldman's called themselves a tech company. A third of their workforce is in tech. So, um I think nowadays it's very, very hard to see how you can build a really big, interesting company without your own tech stack. There are huge amounts of like low code, no code, open source, cloud, et cetera. You don't have to build everything yourself, but you know, if you don't have a tech 
or an engineering team, that would be a pretty big red flag for us, I would say. Same, same here. Um, there are a lot of things that you can outsource, but tech is not one of them. Uh, if you are a tech startup, um, and yeah, it doesn't mean you have to reinvent the wheel. There is a huge amount of APIs and open source and knowledge available, but um, trying to outsource this, I have never seen that work. I think it doesn't give you the the pace that you need to iterate quickly, and you usually have to iterate quickly in the beginning because you're not you don't know exactly how the product should look like that you have in in two years, and and so I think you lose you would lose speed if you're if you're not part of the tech team. Yeah, clear. Okay, um, so yeah, I, I want to round uh, round up and uh, thank you both for for joining. Like I couldn't have thought of better guests to to kick off this content series. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. and uh, more to come. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned. In two days, we're gonna release uh, our investor ranking. Uh, yeah, you're both gonna be on it. Um, so I hope you you share it when it's uh, when it's live. And everybody who is uh, listening, yeah, thanks a lot for joining and uh, hope to see you on our next event. Thanks a lot. Thank you.